Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to say welcome to all of you on behalf of the Department of Political Science and International Relations. Uh, this Diplomacy and Peace Seminar Series, it is the 11th one, so it is going to be a kind of uh, tradition in Ankara, which is our main goal to host ambassadors from other countries in Ankara or our ambassadors uh, abroad to host here and to support curricular activities as an extracurricular activity here at the top university. And I'd like to thank uh, German Ambassador uh, Martin Erdmann for accepting our invitation. Uh, actually, briefly, I'd like to uh, talk about his uh, past and he was uh, Became, he became member of uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. In 1982, I mean during the Cold War years, before the unification, reunification of the, uh, Germany, and he has become diplomat in 1982. Later, he served many places, including Helsinki, but mainly his diplomatic career encompassing NATO activities. And he also was ambassador in Brussels before coming to Ankara uh, as a NATO representative uh, for on behalf of Germany. Since October two, 2015, he has been ambassador in Ankara. Thank you very much for accepting uh, our invitation. He's, uh, as you can see on the PowerPoint, a word in this array, what can be done to fix it? A German bill. I really wonder what your answer will be as a professor at international relations, floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> so, Professor Yalchinkaya, thank you very much for your very kind introductory words and Thank you also for mentioning my CV. Indeed, um, I had joined the German Foreign Service in 1982. I was for many years at NATO in different incarnations, but I can assure you I'm not a cold warrior. <laughs> Very important. So, dear colleagues, no, let me start with the younger people first, uh, the younger audience here. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Um, I'm amazed about the attendance that I can see among young students and professors. <coughs> but I would like to <coughs> welcome also my colleagues. And I see that I'm put at a test here today uh, of professionalism and uh, good ideas maybe. So we'll see if I fulfill your expectations. But let me first say thanks uh, to TOVB University uh, because you provide uh, first, the opportunity for this subject matter, and second, the intellectual open space to address such issues, which I think is very important, and uh, therefore um, also for the younger generation. Um, I think that such a seminar, and you left it to me to choose the subject matter and the title, and even the day, um, is necessary, because when we look around us, the spaces for rational and circumspect behavior in international relations is shrinking. And um, intellectually, I believe it is very rewarding, and that is why I choose this title to analyze the reasons for the current state of affairs in um, the global system. Now, I do not want to claim uh, to possess all the right answers. So my approach is to offer one of possible answers, one of possible answers uh, to this subject matter, which is really multifaceted. And when I choose the title, The World in Disarray, one could also translate this disarray by saying that 
currently the world produces much more history than it can absorb. Or one can also say the world produces more problems at this point than we can absorb. So I would like to, uh, to um, divide my um, talk, my presentation, in three main parts. The first part is I will explain why the period of the times of a stable world order is over. Second, I will then describe a few features which uh, uh, underline, or a few examples that underline how and why the world is a disarray, or why there are so many problems. And finally, I would like to propose ways how to deal with this situation and how we as Germans see a um, possible way out of the current impasse we believe we are in. So I start with um, the first part, namely um, the uh, dominance or the predominance of the Euro-Atlantic world since the end of uh, World War II. And one could also uh, replace the word predominance uh, by the words center of gravity in international relations. The Euro-Atlantic world was and is no more the center of gravity of this a globalized world. Um, the Euro-Atlantic dominance was felt for decades and accepted for decades uh, politically and economically. And the institutions this uh, center of gravity produced have been providing the structures uh, for an international order up to almost today. And let me give you a few examples of this center of gravity's role or predominance. Let's start with the UN Security Council. Still today, three out of five permanent members on the Security Council are uh, from the Euro-Atlantic area, United States, UK, and France. <coughs> when the United Nations were founded, only 51 founding members in 1945 participated in the foundation of the United Nations. Most of them were Europeans and the rest from the other parts of the world, which at that point in time were still under colonial power, <coughs> colonial rule, exercised by <coughs> European powers. Another example is NATO, where I worked for so many years. So Western countries from America and Europe formed NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, in 1949 as an effective defense alliance. And the USA pursued a Pax Americana both in Europe and globally. The strategy was to multilaterally and bilaterally engage nations, such as through the so-called Seattle um, Agreement, the Middle East Treaty Organization, and the Central Treaty Organization, in this region, by the way, of the world. So these are examples of the Euro-Atlantic, in this case, American influence in this part of the world. <coughs> And in addition to that, European cooperation started to establish institutions such as the Council of Europe, the Western European Union. It started economic cooperation uh, in the EEC, European Economic Community, which later became then the European Union as we know it today. And shared values in Europe led to the creating, which was crucial 
for shaping regional law, as I said, uh, such as the Council of Europe, or the European Conventions, Convention on Human Rights, which was a role model for other regions in the world, such as Africa. So, this Euro-Atlantic thinking shaped international law in general. In the economic field, uh, the predominance of the Euro-Atlantic world uh, came through such institutions as the Bretton Woods institutions, like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, which until today dominate the economic development and financial regulation. And the Bretton Woods system established the US dollar as the leading trade currency until today. And also this um, engagement of the Euro-Atlantic world produced the so-called GATT agreement, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which later evolved into the World Trade Organization. So this Euro-Atlantic world shaped the world for decades, but these times are clearly over. And it is obvious that we have a, a situation in which the demographic factor changes, changes the weight uh, of global influence. And let me explain that by a few figures. In 1950, which was the year of the creation of this Euro-Atlantic order, the world comprised some 2.5 billion people out of which 900 million were Europeans or North Americans. 900 million out of 2.5. Today, as we all know, the world counts 7.5 billion individuals, out of which still only 900 million, 1 billion are Europeans. In other words, the relative weight of the European populations or Euro-Atlantic populations has decreased considerably. And so has the gross national product of the economies, which before uh, comprised some 70% of the global uh, share and is down now to 50% in 2070. So in other words, the preconditions for the Euro-Atlantic influence in the world has considerably diminished. That is the balance of my first chapter. And here I come to the second chapter, which is a description of the world in disarray, or a world that is producing more problems than it can absorb. So what we have perceived over the past decades is a subtle but steady reduction of the Euro-Atlantic influence and a power shift to um, other regions in the world. Meanwhile, the contribution of the European economies to gross world emerging um, economies um, and regions is diminishing. We see booming economies in Asia, and we will soon see similar regions in Africa. As a result, we see that those Euro-Atlantic values and institutions that I just described, um, and which have provided stability and prosperity in the past, are today weakened and on the defensive. This is not only due to re-emerging players such as China, but mainly because of political developments within Europe and within the United States. So, for instance, the election of President Trump is a result of an American people and electorate who is increasingly inward-looking, self-interested and internationally disengaging. And the pendulum between internationalism or international engagement and isolationism 
these days is moving backwards to isolation as we have seen it roughly 100 years ago. Um, the Americans clearly are tired of interventionism. As I see it, their engagement in the Balkans, in Afghanistan, in Libya, has led to a point in time where the engagement in Syria is no more acceptable by the US electorate. This also goes for NATO, where the effectiveness and unity of NATO is challenged uh, because there is a question of the protection, mutual protection in NATO based on Article 5, as the American president has put that publicly into question. And then there is also a reduction in trade liberalism, as we have seen it for so many decades, um, leaving such important regional free trade agreements such as NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, or TPP, the Transatlantic, the Trans-Pacific Partnership with Asia, uh, uh, apart. And the confidence in the validity of international agreements, based on the fact on the same Pacta sunt servanda, and regional stability are also tested if the U.S. administration <coughs> unilaterally withdraws from the nuclear agreement with Iran, which we very much uh, deplore. But the current weakness of the Euro-Atlantic space also is the result of the failure of Europeans. So I do not want to singly, simply finger point to the United States, but also the Europeans have left um, um, a vacuum um, and that is uh, uh, stemming from several challenges. Number one, um, the 28 EU member states, still 28, are split on a number of topics that are crucial for the future of the development of the European <coughs> Union. For instance, on migration. For instance, on criteria for financial stability. I'm talking about Euroland. And we perceive that uh, very different understandings of our set of liberal values in the European Union is put into question. For instance, the Prime Minister of Hungary has created a new term, a new definition for what he calls illiberal democracies. Illiberal democracies. And there is an increasing, finally, disillusion with the European project in different parts of the European societies, the emergence of rightist parties uh, who have a destination, and that is to say, uh, we don't want this European Union any longer in the Netherlands, in Finland, in France, and in other countries. And we see the Brexit, which is probably uh, the case in point with regard to the disintegration of Europe. And there is even talk about ETAL exit, a possible, um, a possible farewell of Italy uh, to the European Union. And then finally, just to enumerate a bit more, to mention the European Parliament, which is today highly fragmented in different political groups and subgroups, and there are even parliamentarians in the European Parliament who clearly aim at destroying the European Union and its present structure. And we see at the same time <coughs> um, assertive actors, assertive actors who are exploiting the current weakness of the, let's say, uh, Euro-Atlantic oriented uh, actors. One is on a global level Russia, as I see it, uh, which has not fulfilled its obligation of the IMF treaty, which were just recently suspended by both the United States and Russia. And in the Middle East, in this region, 
we see that Russia is taking advantage of the strategic withdrawal of the United States from this region, be it Syria or be it Libya. In Europe, Russia has aggressively pursued its national interests and destabilized countries in its neighborhood. Let me mention Crimea, March 2014. Let me mention uh, Georgia in 2008. And let me mention Ukraine uh, only recently, also in 2014 and ongoing. Another actor which is becoming very assertive is China, um, namely uh, assertive with regard to her national interests, be it in the Taiwan Strait or in the South China Sea, or be it vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, where they insist on reunification. And its concept of the Belt and Road Initiative is economically interesting, but may pose strategic and financial challenges to many countries who are attracted by the relative good conditions, seemingly relative good conditions, of this Belt and Road Initiative. And with regard to China, um, technology uh, Technology advance and technology uh, modernization also uh, plays an important role because uh, with regard to uh, the modernization uh, of its economy and its technology as a state-run and directed economy, it is well protected with um, high, uh, high um, tech companies and its access to the massive amount of data without respecting individual human rights. So in other words, this uh, challenge is also one which fills the vacuum that the Euro-Atlantic world is leaving behind. And that I think we all have to be aware of. Which brings me to my third chapter, namely what can we do to fix uh, this situation that I tried to describe, number one, um, the farewell to a world that was dominated by Euro-Atlantic institutions, and second, a world that is full of uh, problems in terms of um, no common ground with regard to the respect of um, uh, laws and common rules in, in general. So, what can be done to fix it. Um, our solution to this situation, the German solution to this situation, is to swim against uh, um, the tide. Namely, to strengthen those forces and structures that in the past have successfully provided stability, peace, and prosperity. What the world needs is, we believe, effective multilateralism um, that preserves a liberal world order. And as you might recall, some two weeks ago, Chancellor Merkel and President Macron have signed the Treaty of Aachen, which is a treaty of close, co closer cooperation uh, based on the Elysee Treaty of 1950, uh, 1963, um, where uh, Germany and France want to combine forces to fight for this liberal world order. And why are we doing that? Why is Germany striving uh, 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 for this multilateralism and this liberal world order? Because it is part of our core national interests. As a globally connected economy, the future on, of Germany depends very much on a resilient and rules-based international order. We believe in a world in which the power of the rule of law is far more important than the rule of the powerful. 
Therefore, the German diplomacy and foreign uh, policy works for strengthening and enhancing institutions such as EU, NATO, United Nations, where we are currently a non-permanent member, OSCE, G7, but also effective formats such as G20, where Turkey is a member in. Formats, more informal formats such as E3 plus 3, that is France, UK, USA, Germany, Russia, China, for the Iran nuclear agreement, something which has uh, worked out very well until recently. Or let me give you another example that is the so-called Normandy format, which is a format of France um, uh, and uh, Germany with regard to Ukraine um, in the Crimean crisis. With regard to the United States, uh, we work towards a more balanced partnership. Clearly, the United States is irreplaceable for Europe, is a partner in NATO and in the fight against global terrorism. So, the United States is indispensable for European security. However, we need to strengthen the European pillar uh, in NATO um, and European security efforts um, in order to assure the cohesion um, and the um, effectiveness of the transatlantic uh, security structure. Therefore, against public opinion in Germany, we have increased our military spending with view to creating a European security and defense union. And in this way, as I said, we work closely with France in order to coordinate our foreign and security policy, and that includes our cooperation as we speak in the UN Security Council, where France is a permanent member and Germany is not, and where we nevertheless have um, combined our forces for the two years we are in, in order to uh, give the European voice a stronger impetus. Um, in other words, Germany stands ready to contribute to fill the gap that the United States is leaving. Germany cannot do this alone, of course. Therefore, I say we are contributing, ready to contributing to fill the gap. To this end, we will step up our political, financial, and humanitarian efforts. But let me as, as well state here uh, before this audience that Germany's strength is not to be a military power. That is a very important remark. Our areas of activities is rather diplomacy, uh, civil crisis management, and conflict prevention. This is what we do in the Syria conflict. We provide, provide security uh, within the NATO context with uh, our AWACS contribution, our reconnaissance planes in Jordan. We provide humanitarian assistance in Syria and we are engaged in the political process, such as Geneva talks, small groups, Istanbul summit, uh, etc. And of course, we do share with Turkey um, a huge burden in terms of hosting uh, Syrian refugees. In Turkey, we have 3.5 million which is highly esteemed also in my country and in Europe. Uh, in Germany, we have uh, um, hosted one million uh, Syrian refugees. So, um, having said this, I wanted to provide you with a few examples um, um, uh, how we, Germany, can assist in providing security. I mentioned uh, the importance and the power of free trade. And here we were a strong champion of the recently agreed, uh, recently um, um, uh, entered into force, 1st of February, of the European Japan Free Trade Agreement, which started on the 1st of February, covering 40% of the world trade. Since 2017, we enjoy also the benefits of the European-Canadian 
free trade agreement, the so-called CETA uh, agreement, which entered into force roughly a year ago. So these agreements, which Germany clearly supports and supported when they were um, negotiated, are clear political statements against protectionism and a zero-sum logic. And therefore, we believe in this concept, and therefore we also try to um, uh, make uh, good use of that uh, in the African context where we believe that we should support the African Union to establish its own free trade area. Clearly, in this endeavor, I mentioned security, I mentioned uh, our work in the United Nations, I mentioned uh, trade. In this endeavor of strengthening liberal institutions and mechanisms, we need partners. We can't do that alone, of course. And to this end, the German foreign minister called for the creation of an alliance for multilateralism. Alliance for multilateralism. This is not a formal alliance, but rather a loose network of like-minded, liberal-oriented partners, which strive for preserving and enhancing a rules-based international order. The initiative is aimed at strengthening a effective multilateral order. It's not a close club of liberal idealists and democracies. It's open to all countries that are willing to engage in providing joint solutions to the problems today's world is creating. Be it climate change, increasing protectionism, dealing with the global migration crisis. And we see countries like Canada or Japan, as well as many European countries, as our national, uh, natural allies in this endeavor. I already mentioned France and the uh, Aachen Treaty that was concluded um, a few weeks ago. As the French-German couple, uh, we have agreed in Aachen while signing this treaty, that we will formulate joint statements and positions, be it in the Security Council, in other UN organs, or be it in uh, this regard to positions in the European Union. And we want to coordinate our security cooperation even better, and therefore um, uh, we have established long ago a French-German Defense and Security Council. All of this um, not only will strengthen um, our bilateral bond, France-Germany, but more importantly, the effectiveness of the European Union, because this bilateral cooperation should set an example for other European nations in securing a liberal world order which provides, as we believe, peace, stability, and prosperity for all. So let me conclude by saying that we live in turbulent uh, times in this world. Uh, uh, in disarray, liberal values seem to be on the defensive. However, this is not predetermined. This is not a natural law. Uh, nations are run by human beings, and therefore human beings are also able to change the course of history. And that is what we are aiming at. The stakes are high. So we cannot afford to remain and sit idle. Germany is prepared to invest in a network of like-minded countries which jointly work towards a liberal, rules-based international order. And we hope that as many nations as possible will join this effort. I think we exhausted our time. Mr. Lee, I thank you for your patience. I uh, thank you for the invitation, of course. Well, thank you very much indeed. Yes. Well, probably this is the same one that we gave it before. <laughs> is it? No, no, I don't have it yet. This is different. This is yeah, it's, okay. it's a first. First, but, thank you very much. So let's have a nice talk. Thanks. Yeah. All right.